Also I will give you a brief overview, of course, uh, never can do all in this short time about our work and in general all is re uh, related about this SAW which means surface acoustic wave sensor devices and we do their chemical and biochemical analysis with that. The first section of the talk focuses now on chemical gas analysis with uh, surface acoustic wave based microsensor systems. Here you see already some pictures out of this work. But first I want to uh, tell you about the basic principle which may you know already because Mauro I think he will talk about also in his uh, uh, um, Vorlesung, in his uh, presentations about his talks about this. Uh, we have a surface acoustic wave uh, device which is usually used in uh, mobile phones etc. All the high frequency uh, related electronics nowadays work on these devices. And this device uh, is ba used as a frequency determining element of an oscillator circuit. We c e uh, simply code such a device with a chemical sensitive layer, in our case uh, uh, polymer, and uh, in the biosensing field we code it with a biosensitive layer. I will focus on that later on. We think because we can use uh, here very high frequency. Nowadays these uh, frequencies goes up in the gigahertz range and the sensitivity, so the frequency change due to changes of chemistry on the top on the surface is uh, a function of the square of the operating frequency. So when a chemical interacts with a, <coughs> with a layer on this device the, the polymer increases its weight or the biosensing coating increases also the masses by depleting biosensing molecules, this uh, causes a downward shift in the frequency and this scales with the operation frequency of the device. And since these devices can make very high frequency, we will achieve a very high um, sensitivity and we think the highest sensitivity possible in the, for gravimetric sensor principle, uh, which compares usually with smart quartz microbalances which are very uh, lower in the frequency range, in the frequency range of 10 megahertz only. I stress a little bit about these uh, polymer coatings which we use now for the gas sensing. They are usually, or it's not possible to have a selective polymer coating towards a selectivity towards a certain gas. Uh, so it's more or less semi-selective, so we say. And that's why we have to use an array of sensors and this is our basic uh, uh, approach of our work that we use an array of source sensors which run all independently with their own oscillators and each sensor is coded with a different polymer. And the output is then eight different sensor signals. For all these sensors they are high frequency, we have a common resonant uh, uh, reference oscillator to, uh, which we use to subtract the reference uh, frequency from the sensor frequency so the sensor output is only the difference of each uh, oscillator against the reference oscillator. What we do with that is we interrogate one sensor after the other so we don't uh, let them run all together in parallel at one moment only one is running and the signal is subtracted with this continuously working oscillator. So this is called that we use a, a, a so-called multiplex technique for interrogation the whole array. But as end users you see at least for a certain chemical uh, a signal output, an eightfold signal output of eight different sensors. They are different because of different polymers used on each sensor. Here is an example of probing a xylene. I think you are all chemists here. So you know what is xylene, uh, benzene and ethanol as an example only and we purge with uh, reference gas, also with non-analyte uh, containing gas here in between. So this is absorption mode, desorption mode, absorption mode, desorption mode. And here you see several things in this plot. You see here uh, two subsequent samplings with xylene and you see no difference. This is good. This means our sensors are reproducible. From one measurement to the next, it looks always the same. Here the same for benzene and the same for ethanol. 
But when you see here also these eight sensor signals in parallel, you see here for both benzene and xylene, the red one is the most sensitive, the red sensor, and while the blue ones are very low in sensitivity. So the difference between xylene and benzene is not much in the sensor signal. Why? Because both are aromates. So what we really measure with a set of polymer is something like uh, solubility interactions, physical chemistry, and of course with similar gases they cause about similar sensor uh, outputs uh, with the same set of coatings. When you look at the ethanol signal it's completely different. The ethanol, here the brown comes up, it's a more hydrophilic sensor and uh, uh, the red one is very low, it's not any more sensitive to ethanol. So this means ethanol is also much different to the aromates that we see here a big difference to these. So what we really see with that array is something like physical chemistry. We see solubility interactions with the, um, with the set of coating. So here are more examples. We plot here only the maximum signal of water, methanol, octane, xylene, ethyl acetate and chloroform. And only by a first glance you see big differences. What is plotted here, A, to, uh, a, a B, C, D until H, is only now a name, a short name for our sensors, polymer sensors. So all the polymers are the same, and the same polymers interact completely different towards each gas. So here already you see we have something like a selective detection by using semi-selective polymer coatings. Uh, what we can see here we can also uh, use as automatic um, as an automatic readout in computers we can use so-called neural networks which uh, uh, accept the sensor signals as they are and we train such uh, in a mathematical al algorithm and we get desired output after appropriate, uh, appropriate training. Also we can use a standard statistic method like PCA <coughs> which um, project uh, the eightfold space, the sensors, we have eight sensors, so we have an eightfold space, uh, an imaginary space, we can imagine only three folds, but uh, mathematically you can uh, project such an eight, uh, and a result in the eightfold space, also in a, a twofold space, which means component one, component two, we can project uh, the, the, the measurements and then we can uh, represent the, all the measurements taken from one analyte they cluster then in a cloud in a special section in this area and with separation of these clouds we have then successfully uh, um, discriminate between the single components. How it looks the array in, in, in principle we have uh, self-made saw devices with big electrodes here you see the saw uh, acoustic path, the, the interdigital uh, transducers which generate the acoustics is in the middle. So this is the acoustic sensing path and this comes upside down on two mill channels which leads the gas from here to here. So this means nothing else, we, leave, we, we guide the gas through the electronics to the high frequency electronics. With that measure, so uh, uh, eight sensors fit here inside, four by four. Here the situation is shown that we have only three put inside. Um, with this measure we have a greatly reduced passive surface area and um, uh, we receive a very low um, sampling volume which is very good for further sample treatment before we detect the gases. Here's an example which we did with sharing, which addresses exactly that what, uh, what I missed. You can represent such a, a, um, a pattern which I shown also as radar plot. And um, these radar plots are shown here for different chemicals. And together with the sharing company, we, um, this is DMT, water, uh, DMSO, uh, so such typical compounds uh, within a chemical factory. And all these compounds have different patterns, meaning that we can identify uh, the, the nature of a, a vapor uh, easily by detecting such patterns. And what we can see here by the naked eye, 
we can also differentiate by a computer uh, program which uses neural networks. Here's the same uh, shown in the uh, PC uh, principal component analysis in a certain space that we have here all these chemicals isolated from each other. Two dots means two subsequent measurements from the same compound uh, with a little bit chemical noise. That's why they cluster only. But it's important that, uh, um, in, in, um, that the area is small against the distance between the clusters. This means we can separate the compounds from each other. By the way, if we have a mixture of DMP and H2O, that's water, uh, 50 by 50, because we, we have a physical chemistry lying uh, behind the solubility interactions, we will have a cluster of these measurements here in the middle. So we can really um, measure then also the, uh, the um, um, concentrations of one compound with the other. We can identify uh, in a cluster in between, for instance. An instrument who can do that has only this size by having all this uh, uh, sensor array inside is miniaturized um, with uh, eight differently coded sensors. It contains already one pump and one valve to, uh, to measure between the analyte and the reference gas. And uh, with that we can have a, a fast and continuous identification of targets analytes between one to four seconds. And the power consumption of the whole instrument is only 1.6 Watt, which is very good compared to uh, other methods. But using Schatzen is such an interest, uh, instrument without further sample treatment, is the, the, it, uh, the sensitivity is restricted to several ppm's only. So we cannot go in the very often very interesting PBB level where some poison gases may already uh, make a limit, uh, a workplace limit or so. This is a restriction. So this instrument, so like it is, is only good for simple identification. What is inside the tank or is it in a tank already cleaned or not? Or maybe inside there are some residual so solvents, etc. When we want to go into the PBB level, we have to make a, um, a sample preparation. And here in this case, we have to introduce a pre-concentrator, which we call microtrap. How we do that? We have the saw sensor array here at this side. We have a trap and pumps, a system of pump, pumps and valves. Now we aspirate with the pump at a high flow rate, the analyte over the whole system. We zero the saw sensors on the non-enriched analyte coming in from here. And in, in one cycle, for instance, we, we blow one liter gas through the system. Then we stop the flow, the pump is stopped, and then we heat up the trap. The trap absorbs the analyte, it becomes dissolved when we heat up the, the trap material, for instance, Tenax. And then we blow it back at a very small flow rate, 1 over 100 over the sensor. What happens while desorption, a cloud of enriched analytes is around the trap and we push it slowly back. And then the sensor will go up and down when this cloud is running enriched over the sensors. The whole thing can be done in, in a cycle of two minutes. And here's an example where we use perchloroethylene at a concentration of uh, 4 ppm only at a um, trapping time, that time five minutes. This is made at 0% relative humidity. This is made at 75% relative humidity. Here about, we have 75% relative humidity. We never can exist in 0% relative humidity. This is below desert level. We cannot open the ice, it will dry. But it's easy to get, of course, when you have simply a gas bottle as reference gas the output is more or less 0% humidity. So now we compare the pattern. This is an 8-fold signal, as I said, and so we can have also the pattern inside these peaks. This is the peak which arises from the fact that we, we, uh, we push slowly the cloud around the microtrap over the sensors. 
And then you see here the typical pattern of perchloroethylene in both cases, but here with 0% relative humidity and here with 75% relative humidity. What does it mean? You have to realize that 75% relative humidity is 50,000 ppm. So here we switch off 50,000 ppm, here we switch on 50,000 ppm. And beside this distortion we see the same signal pattern and the same height. So actually this is what we want to have. We want to, have, we want to get rid of humidity influences. You see the residual influences here in the following signals, that's all. But we don't have to uh, observe them because we can switch them off. We can only switch the pumps faster and then the sensors are even not treated with this uh, um, spurious humidity effect and we see only the peaks with this shape, typical shape of perchloroethylene which is the same if you use 7 or 75 percent relative humidity. So we have lots of, uh, of advantages out of this. We have uh, sample cycles, typical of three minutes now. Uh, we have of course a great improvement of sensitivity uh, we greatly reduce the sensitivity to major components. Nobody wants to measure water, usually. And um, of course, we build our baseline by ourselves. We don't have to use a clean gas anymore. We don't have to use a filter for to clean up a gas, or we don't have to use a bottle, or etc. So a uh, perfect situation to have a system running here and measure in the room if uh, there is some contamination or not. So the trap system looks like here. You can see that all in Mauro's lab. He has such systems, especially this one. This is the complete system opened up. The sensor head with the eight sensors, data electronic, and here the add-on system with the uh, pre-concentrator. We call it also Saga sometimes as surface, uh, acoust as, as surface acoustic wave gas analyzing system. Here is a uh, list of, uh, of um, 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 different uh, analytes which we test over the years with the, with the sensitivity and the important limits of detection. And in some interesting ones we reduced uh, the limits uh, of detection, uh, please see, into the PBB level. This is required by industry to have PBB levels safely detected. So in uh, all the times we have uh, in parallel of the development lots of collaborations with companies. One famous company, maybe you know it, is the Traeger company. Also for Brazil market I think they are very active when you go in hospital and you get operated. The anesthetics, everything you, which makes you breathe while operation comes from the Traeger company. Then uh, sharing, I, I've shown already this uh, identification uh, in, in a vessel. And uh, we also have um, efforts to make a monitoring of natural gas because they got uh, uh, odorized together with a big gas delivery country, uh, company some food applications but I will show some more food things later. And of course we have now uh, some uh, a collaboration with Mao. he told her, that's why here the sign of the UFRJ came up, come up, and uh, one big thing which we did already and he has here in the lab is that we have an a, a enhanced uh, system now running in his lab which uses even a GC uh, a column uh, for the detection of very complex gas mixtures, especially for everything which uh, together with food applications. And uh, we start with the typical food of Brazil, which is coffee. Uh, to make a prototypical coffee analyzer. This is the coffee analyzer. Uh, it even involves the coffee mill because in the work it turned out that uh, as far you open the freshly milled coffee already the uh, lots of uh, compounds go out and you have no reproducible results anymore. So after milling you have to, you have to measure the headspace right after milling without opening the cover. That's why the system can control even the coffee mill. Uh, it, it gives, uh, it, it mills the coffee and then aspirates in uh, the, the headspace of the coffee right after milling. This is made here. 
we have even to condensate out uh, water compen uh, water contaminate or too much water inside we have here a trap not because of the uh, very low also because but the, the, the most motivation is to concentrate the sample on a to focus the sample on a small area and then to flush it over the system into a GC color capillary with a narrow uh, receiving a na very narrow line to measure uh, the retention time with the source sensor system as the detector. Uh, here's the complete system with the running PC in the lab of Mauro. And here you see only one example uh, as characterization of the system where we have a mixture of xylene, limonene and lots of humidity and without using the GZ inside you see here one peak, everything is collected in the trap and then let over the sensor. So this would make some pattern. But when we run it over the GC, of course we have a separation into three lines because we have three different compounds inside and in each of these lines contain eight sensor signals so we have now a multi-multi-dimensional space. We have not only eight-fold space, we have an, a multi-dimensional space because all these retention numbers will build a own space. And in each of these lines we can pattern recognize what is inside, what is that for a compound inside these lines. So it's, uh, it's very similar to the result of a GCMS, also with a mass spectrometer. So the next example, what I want to show you briefly is that we have also uh, an analyze uh, system to um, uh, detect contaminates in soil. We, we did that already in the past, but we want to uh, promote the system here in Brazil as well. And you can see it also in Mauro's lab with a system we built in a, in a long way very narrow way, only uh, three, uh, 35 millimeters. Here the sensor array and a special miniaturized electronics. And on the, on the uh, right side of it, as an extension, we have also a sample system containing a pump, a valve, and uh, also enrichment unit with a certain uh, uh, glass uh, to, for the sample. And what we can do, we can detect in the soil by pushing that instrument into the soil, we can detect contamination in the soil. Here's an example on very low depths of only 180 meters, 1.80 meters. The depth profile of an artificial contamination of benzene in a, in a <coughs> uh, lab in Stuttgart. We make this, they have an artificial soil, but we measured also in the field close to our uh, KIT in Karlsruhe we have a contaminated uh, soil for testing and then we hammered really the instrument inside the soil and measured with the computer in parallel uh, the signal of the instrument and this is the result and this was known in seven meters the contamination starts before it's nothing but at least we we put it we hammered it seven meters into the soil and then we got the signal we wanted to push it farther but then the data connection failed because uh, we, we have to put additional tubes inside and then uh, the, the, um, uh, the distance to the measurement system was too far for the infrared data connection inside the tube. <coughs> Another actual pro uh, uh, project is the low cost analysis of fuel. We are just discussing with people in Brasilia here uh, future projects where we want to characterize the, the composition of fuel, the comp uh, the, if there are markers inside or not, or if there are additives inside or not. But I, uh, due to the time I cannot go into details with that. And also what we did uh, with Mauro already when he was uh, in our lab is he had a very good idea to use uh, polyurethane uh, to stabilize the sensing polymers. This gives us uh, the possibility to use almost any sensitive polymer, even if it is honey-like, and we can fix it on our sensors. So 
the choice of possible uh, uh, polymers for analysis is now much bigger and the aging properties are perfect now we can even uh, um, put the sensors inside the solvent uh, which we just use for coating because the polyurethane makes a, com uh, 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 a complete good polymer who which traps the sensing polymer inside uh, uh, the sensing film. So this is the first part. No, I want to make an outlook. What we have also is uh, we have a new system now running with a new electronic update and a new configuration change. We have the sensors now in line in one channel and another electronic uh, regime to let them run. Eight sensors in parallel. Uh, it's maybe not so important for the end user but it's very important for the developer because we can see more of the sensor signal we have more parameters to to read out we, uh, we, it can be used like a, a, a vector a network analyzer uh, we can we have a, um, the possibility to make a vector impedance analysis inside the system with sensors inside the system and uh, the probe by an analyte I come to the next section. This is the biochemical part of my talk. Um, we use the same principle, again, the very high frequency range. Uh, so not much to say. The only difference is that we use here a biochemical layer. I will focus on this later. And we use some other devices uh, which we got from Siemens. What is the specialty? Is that they are so-called surface acoustic wave resonators and they use uh, another type of surface waves, so-called surface shear waves, which uh, are not like water waves going like this. They go like this, they are in the plane, so they cannot push the water up, and that's why they are not attenuated. To do this, we have to fulfill another important precondition uh, in water that uh, we have to use a, a substrate material from a lithium tantalate, which has a light, uh, very high uh, uh, dielectric constant of 43, because we have to overcome the high dielectric constant of water, which is 80. In air, of course, we have an environment of one. We can use quartz as substrate material, but here we have to use a very special sensor material. And when these conditions are fulfilled, we, uh, it's also possible to let a surface acoustic wave device run in water. Think about that it's traveling like this and not like this. So in the biology it's very important the flow cell that is even smaller than that what I've shown you. And actually we the first approach to have it very um, close into the electronic, the device is 4 by 4 millimeter, was this approach for biology, we put the device upside down into this cavity, which is then probed from behind with water. And uh, how we treat the sensors, we, uh, to make uh, biosensors out of surface acoustic wave devices, we start with lithium tantalate as substrate material, we have gold transducers on it, and first of all, we do a homogenization of the uh, surface with a perylene C layer. After this, the, the, the surface is chemically homogeneous and we don't, we don't have to face different properties of uh, surfaces. <coughs> then we immobilize a functional uh, a, a matrix on it which can accept antibodies or a chemical receptor. Usually we use their dextrin or polyethylene glycol. This is something which also all the other people do, do which uh, use uh, biosensors. Only we have here the surface acoustic wave device below. So starting with this green layer our sensor behaves like other biosensor, like a surface plasma resonance uh, biosensor, for instance. So we can do all the biochemical steps in the same way like we would have uh, the, a sensor from our competitors in the lab. So, and then with this, in this layer, we can easily uh, covalently bind um, immobiliz uh, immobilization capture molecules um, like antibodies, etc. 
And then, of course, after probing, we detect the desired analyte. And in contrast to the semi-selective polymers, we have now a very selective reaction. We, uh, the, the antibodies will react only with the antigen, plus typical with a non-specific uh, part of the reaction, which means uh, which addresses then the body of the antibody. So actually, we. We have to uh, use not an, really an array. We would uh, be able to use uh, a, a sensor array with only two sensors, having a specific antibody and a non-specific antibody, and subtract the signal from air from both. Uh, here's an example what we did. Here on the sensor, we immobilized folic acid. The analyte is antifolic acid. Here's the reaction. The antibody injection was here in this stage. Of course, we have some tubings, it's delayed. And then the sensors start to interact. Here is the concentration level, here is zero. And then a half microgram per milliliter, one microgram per milliliter, etc., etc. And you see here already in the beginning phase, we have uh, something like a linear interaction. Linear means dynamically linear. So it is a, we are able to only uh, detect the slope and without with the detecting the slopes, we have here already inside the slopes uh, a linear interaction with the, con uh, with the concentration. So actually we don't have to wait until the sensor reaction is to an end because you see the time is much longer than in the, in the gas phase. We, we wait here 10 minutes or so for the reaction. But this depends also about uh, from the sampling system. So in the past we did a lot of uh, activity also with partners, uh, some publications. Here even a detection of penicillin milk where we received really uh, um, the, we, we, we could um, detect the limit, the required limit of detection even. But now I want to focus a little bit about uh, disposability and reusability. Um, the biosensor reaction is not reversible like the gas sensor reaction. So we have to replace the biosensor each time. But usually it requires also that all the tubings and the sampling cell has to be replaced also for medical application, etc. So here we have in our approach this device itself has to be disposable and this one was reusable but this is not acceptable in reality so uh, um, the, the medical company would laugh about that they will not take it serious so what we have to replace the sample cell also each time how we do it we have to place the saw device in the same way in a miniaturized plastic unit in a miniaturized plastic cell which looked like this, upside down again, but it facing a window, and through this window we can put all the biochemistry over the sensor. And with this window we can uh, address also several sensors in sequence, like we did before. Now I start again to use an array, you see. This is a small four sensor array already, the approach, and this this uh, uh, thing is a, a common cover for four separated biosensors. <coughs> so this shows only that we have to fabricate it. We have to fabricate it very accurately to have reproducible signals in all uh, stages. We have to apply a glue. We have to apply a, um, a conductive glue, a glue for sealing, etc., etc. This is all done automatically in our lab. And now we have to address such uh, a, a miniaturized system with pumps and valves and this is the next problem, how we can do that. And here it is shown when you have, for instance, three channels uh, put behind each other in this configuration, you can have analytes A, B, C, D in one sequence over the sensor. So you have to only fill a common channel like this and then you can let run different analytes through the sensor the one single sensor or the sensor array. And having this, you have minimal vol dead volume effects and uh, very fast response times to expect. 
But again, how to achieve that and what is about the dispersion which take place from here to here? For that, uh, usually you use, uh, we, we introduce a so-called liquid-liquid separation by an oil. This is the, uh, um, uh, the so-called liquid plug using an oil. We use for this tetradecane. The analyte is here the yellow part and here the reference solution. And you see here we have one, two, three solutions in use just like the uh, example before. And here is now our chip which takes up again eight sensors. We have eight positions here where we put the source sensors inside and we can fill it up with the different analytes. Um, but again, how we pump and we control these liquids without having valves in place here, without having a pump inside. So what we do is we do it indirectly. We don't pump the, uh, the analyte and the water. We pump, we pump, the, uh, uh, we pump oil by so-called uh, fluid exchanger. So we can exchange the fluid, we can exchange oil to analyte and vice versa by doing this. And this allows us having all the, the valves and the pump outside of the system. And we connect the system with the inner parts only after this fluid exchanges. Outside we have one, one reservoir of tetradecan and one big pump, which pumps only from the outside uh, oil and inside we change the oil into water like we wish. And with this regime we can fill up this chip uh, with a complete sequence of measurements and this chip is then completely replaced while the outside is reusable because it, the outside will see only oil. This is the outside system. This is then the multi-use uh, part of the system. And you see, of course, as lab uh, uh, setup, it looks very complicated. You see a lot of valves here, the fluid exchangers. But here is the chip, and only this has to be replaced. And it is run completely, liquidly remote controlled. Like here, remote control, but with oil as controlling liquid. And here's an example of the capability. Here is only an example of uh, two solutions with different uh, conductivities. This is without tetradecane plug, even in that uh, compact system, and this with tetradecane plug. And here, while the tetradecane is present, the, the, uh, the uh, conductivity is very low, and the source sensors see that. And here we have the, uh, the a salt solution with a different uh, uh, sol uh, conductivity compared to that and the, uh, the, the level is very fast reached and then again the next plug uh, and we are back very fast. So perfect signal shapes, this is what you dream of as uh, biochemists. And we got this also patented, this method. And here we see a first approach of a complete si biosensor system running with that uh, regime, here the reality with uh, this big handle who press everything on top but you see here the inside here is the big plastic chip the electronics which is then flipped over the plastic chip here are all the fluid connectors and here you see a zoom out of the eight positions of the uh, for the saw devices the saw devices in their plastic housings and here the saw device fitted in with the saw devices and so far everything looks perfect. Ah, now it comes. But we got permanent ceiling problem with that setup. This was the drama. This was the work of Bastian Rapp. You know that. Uh, he, he has lots of micro-mechanical tricks inside. He shaped it a little bit like a cone or so. But at least we press here plastic into plastic without uh, any ceiling. And this is at least not tight not tight enough. And that's why we are just currently doing the next step. Here this is a, the new uh, biosensor chip made from COC. But again we have the saw device upside down. Looks like a SIM card. 
And here the other side, we have here again a window to that the device is accessible for biochemical modifications. And here, very important, this is now a single uh, uptake, the, a single cover with an exposed inlet and outlet. We can adjust it so the, 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 the square of the sample of the, of the, um, the sample chamber is uh, changeable and of course this black is a ceiling and then this is tight and we can work with it and we make also new electronic around it with a Japanese industrial partner and even we have an approach again to have our eightfold arrays together and uh, this is done even with one only uh, uh, what is that prototype that we that we use a radial system where we can put a common ana analyte inside which gets detected by eight different uh, biosensors. Now you can ask why we use eight different biosensors when we have to use only two specific and specific uh, reaction. The problem is that the body is complex as a human body everything it is not enough to test one marker for uh, cancer, for instance, uh, only uh, because for everybody the markers, uh, the, 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 the protein markers, they change from body to body all the time. But not the, uh, the relation from mar one marker to the other. This may be significant. When you have three or four markers significantly change towards one direction, then it's significant as a diagnosis, a medical diagnosis. That's why we use again eight. We love the number eight because our data uh, evaluation, everything is focused on eight sensor signals in parallel. So don't worry. This was my last, <laughs> my last slide. Thank you for attention. <laughs>